I'm Ariane Elfant, and this is Death, the Podcast. Death may be defined as the destruction or permanent end of something. At Death, the Podcast, we are looking closely at what happens when something ends. We listen, learn about, and discuss the stories that surround the subject of death. These stories bring up much more than feelings of fear and sadness. They offer opportunities for connection, for hope, and sometimes even for humor. Ultimately, if we are open to exploring death, we create greater potential to experience life. My guest today is Dr. Judith Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz has provided end-of-life consultations to incurably and terminally ill adults for over 15 years. She currently works as the Clinical Director of of End-of-Life Choices New York and previously was the East Coast Clinical Director for Compassion and Choices. Dr. Schwartz is a former critical care nurse and received her doctoral degree in nursing research from NYU. In addition to providing bedside consultations for terminally ill patients, Dr. Schwartz is well-published and lectures both professional and lay audiences about her work. She is here today on Death the Podcast to talk with us about how her organization provides the terminally ill with options about how they die. Welcome, Dr. Schwartz. It's very nice to be with you. You provide people with legal choices to hasten death. People might confuse what you do with assisted suicide. What is the difference between assisted suicide and aid in dying? It's a very good question, and it's an important distinction that we make in the work that we do. We work with people who are, for one thing, decisionally capable. So that means they're able to make a thoughtful and informed decision about what's right for them as deaf nears. And when we talk about uh, choice in dying or aid in dying, we're talking about providing information about end-of-life options that people may consider and decide about in terms of what's best for them. So there are lots of ways that one can control, for example, the circumstances and timing of one's death that are both perfectly legal and supported by mainstream medicine, palliative care, hospice clinicians that have nothing to do with suicide. What I do believe very strongly is that decisionally capable people who are living with, as you said, progressive, incurable, and or terminal illnesses have every right to have as much information about options and choices that are legally supported uh, about about their, their end of life. Now, you may know there are a number of states across the country that have legalized aid in dying, physician aid in dying. In none of those states is that considered to be an act of assisted suicide by by legislative language and by practice. They're not assisting in suicide. People who are terminally ill have no choice about whether they're going to die. They are going to die. The only choice they have sometimes is about when they're going to die. So that's a difference that I think is very important. Mm -hmm. What are the differences in what you do and what hospice is asked to do? What my organization and I in particular do is provide information about an array of options and often tell people about hospice, inform them about what hospice can do for them, what it provides, what they can expect, what they have to pay for. They don't. Um, And uh, But we're not clinicians. We are people trained individuals who provide information. So I'm a bedside consultant. I spend a lot of time talking to patients and families. I don't change their dressings. I'm not concerned about providing medication. I am concerned, for example, if they're not getting adequate pain management, for example, or if they have other poorly managed symptoms uh, that are distressing to them, whether it's nausea or vomiting, even though they're in hospice, they may not be sufficiently informed about how to talk to their clinicians, their, their hospice nurse or their hospice doctor about their symptoms. And if clinicians don't know the symptoms, they certainly can't begin to do anything about it. So I'm the provider of information. I'm an advocate. I support patients and families to ask the questions they need to ask in order to get the information they need in order to make an informed choice. Hospice does 
some of that, but they're much more focused on quality of life symptom management. Their goal is to help patients live as well as they can for as long as they can, but they don't take any kind of active steps to prolong the process of dying in any way. And if you meet with somebody and they are interested and open to hastening um, mm -hmm. death, mm -hmm. what what are one's options? The options that somebody who's terminally ill can explore with their clinicians are several. If they want to hasten their death, they're in hospice, they will have stopped taking all life-prolonging measures. Like they will stop taking their digoxin, certainly their vitamins. They'll, if they have an implanted defibrillator, that should be turned off. So any life-prolonging measure that they have been taking should be stopped in conjunction, obviously, with medical oversight. That also can include stopping oral nutrition and hydration. Um, often it's the case that people who are living with advanced disease have very little appetite anyhow, and often they're only eating because their loved ones are saying, look what I made for you. You have to get stronger. Eat to keep your strength up. And so when hospice tells the family members that this is not act helping their, their loved one, in fact, it might make them more physically uncomfortable because as the body gets close to death, it can't metabolize food and fluid in the way that it used to. So stopping eating and drinking is a natural way of dying, and people have died that way for generations, either intentionally or secondarily to a disease state. But that's certainly one option, and even those who are not yet in the terminal stage of a disease. For example, maybe they have Parkinson's disease, and they've had Parkinson's disease for 20 years, and they're becoming more and more and more symptomatic, and the quality of life has diminished to a point that they want to hasten their death. They're not terminally ill, so they may not yet be eligible for hospice support, but they certainly are eligible for good palliative care symptom management, and they have every right legally, clinically, and, and ethically to stop eating and drinking if they choose in order to hasten their own death. So that's an option that's available both to people who are terminally ill and those who are not yet in the terminal stage of disease. Uh, the, the other ways that folks... Uh, can can hasten their death. It's a similar kind of thing. Uh, folks who are enrolled in hospice, who are close to death, who have symptoms associated with their disease that have become very, very difficult to manage, and that does happen. They can be basically put to sleep, made to be unconscious, so they're not experiencing any of that distress. Maybe it's terrible shortness of breath, or maybe it's untreatable nausea. Um, they can be made unconscious, and so of course they're not going to be eating or drinking. So the combination of the sedating medications, the opiates for pain, and um, the fact that they're not eating and drinking will indeed secondarily hasten their death. In the states where aid in dying is legal, um, they can acquire a prescription for a lethal amount of medication so long as they go through all of the requirements in those states and are able to self-administer that medication. So the V said the voluntary stopping of eating and drinking. How, how long does it typically take for somebody to die who does that? And what kind of suffering is involved? Good question. Uh, for somebody who has an underlying disease like cancer, the average, and we have a few, not very many, but a few studies that have actually looked at the experience of those terminally ill patients enrolled in hospice who have chosen to be said, even in states like Oregon, where they could have gotten lethal medication, they, for some, they choose instead to fast. Because in most cases, death occurs within two weeks. The average is 10 days. Um, it can take longer than that to acquire the lethal medication and go through all of the safeguards that are required in, in states like Oregon and Washington and California now and Vermont and the rest of the states. Um, for those who don't yet have a terminal diagnosis but who are suffering from an incurable and progressive disease, it's harder to predict, but it's at least two weeks it, from two to three weeks. The issue is how able the person is to stop all oral intake, but it's the fluid that matters. You die of dehydration. And in fact, 
uh, for people who are terminally ill, we find that this is actually a fairly peaceful, gentle kind of slipping away. The person gets sleepier and sleepier. They end up being in bed all the time. They're very weak, and then they slip into a coma. With those who are not terminally ill, like people who are post-stroke and paralyzed on part of their body, or for those people who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease or early set on Alzheimer's disease, and they want to avoid the final stages of the disease that they find just unbearable, it's a much tougher, it's a much tougher commitment. The good thing about stopping eating and drinking or VSET is the patient gets to decide each day whether they will continue to fast, whether it's harder than they thought, whether they realize that it's, they're not quite ready for this. So they get to decide. They are absolutely in control. They absolutely also must have support from caregivers and social support from loved ones or family members because this is hard to do. Um, the biggest problem is a feeling of a dry mouth or dry mucous membranes, and there are basic nursing care, oral care skill things that are not high tech that can help minimize that distress along with very small doses of opiates and um, sedating medication so that the person is pretty sleepy, particularly during the initial days where you might be thinking about nothing else but how thirsty you are. So we want it to not be a terrible experience, but for some people it's a really big challenge. For people that drink all the time, that drink fluid all the time, it, it can be really challenging. It sounds like you're really an expert at assessing that, that window of time that people are in of, of their readiness. We talk about it a lot. And, and at the same time, the trick is to not get out in front of people. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you give them information. You give the, and, and I see my job as empowering people with information. What they do with that information is entirely up to them. I've, I've written quite a lot about this. Um, and because, you know, there's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of confusion. And frankly, even hospice clinicians, nurses, aides, are very worried that they might be legally or morally culpable for allowing somebody to commit suicide. You know, when you, when you stop eating and drinking, the question is, are you causing your own death and is that not suicide? So it becomes something that needs to be really thoughtfully discussed. So that's the point of a lot of the writing that I do. I really try to inform nurses, social workers, clinicians to reframe this option in a way that when, when, when decisionally capable patients say to their nurse, I can't stand this, what can I do to speed up this process? Will you help me? And when hospice nurses put up their hand either literally or metaphorically and say, no, I can't help you with that. That would be assisting in suicide. I don't do that. It makes me crazy uh, because that's not, that's not the response. The response is, tell me what's happening. T let's talk about this. What are you feeling? What's going on? Because they may have some problem that they haven't told anybody about that can be relieved. I mean, the goal here is not to help people end their lives. The goal here is to help people have the least bad death possible under circumstances, ideally, and timing of their choosing. I think that's what many people want, not all, and don't misunderstand me. People have to find us, right? We don't go out seeking to shake the trees to get people to see the world we do. Everybody has their own view about what's the right way to die. But I think increasingly, because we are now permitting these kinds of conversations, like the one that occurs on your podcast, people are talking about options in ways that they never did before. They thought they always had to do what the doctor said, right? Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not trained. They don't know the answer. The doctor knows best. And for some people, that's still an appropriate choice. And it's all about choice. I was so interested to learn about your dissertation on what it's like for nurses when patients ask for aid in dying and wondering what you found out. You know what was interesting about that was that was the only question I asked. This was a qualitative study, right? So it wasn't checking off boxes in, in a survey. This was face-to-face -face interviews with nurses who responded to my question have you ever had the experience of having a decisionally capable patient ask you for assistance in dying? 
This is morally very murky land, the business of, of morally distinguishing um, right from wrong in end of life interventions is very challenging. It truly is. And the only way you can really sort this stuff out is having the opportunity to discuss it with, with colleagues, with, with, um, with uh, uh, professional clinicians who have more experience than you do. Um, and those opportunities often don't exist in clinical practice. Five of these 10 nurses were hospice nurses. And and, the, and I might add that the array of their interventions went from left to right. There were some that would say to those patients, I can't help you with, it, well, with what I think you're asking me to do. I'll lose my license. Absolutely not. And on the other end of the bell-shaped curve were those that said, I'll write you a prescription right now, and here's what you need to do to take that medication. Um, so, th so it was a complete array, right? But many and most of those nurses were in the middle of the huge bell-shaped curve, right? And like some of the hospice nurses would say, hospice nurses know exactly what's going on in the household. They absolutely know what their patients and families are doing. Some of them choose not to know specifically. And so they would say to the family members who would say, what would happen if I give a little bit more, a little bit more often? And the hospice nurses would say to them, listen, I can't advise you about this, but there's plenty of stuff in the house. You do what you think is right for your patient, and I won't chart this conversation. So in the way I looked at that uh, as a, you know, sort of an objective observer is, gee, you're kind of abandoning that family to, to do the best they can under really difficult circumstances. Um, I mean, it's not for me to say that they did anything right or wrong, but it seemed to me that it that it made it particularly challenging for family members. Now, whether they did or they did not take steps to hasten their loved one's death, I don't know, and I don't know that the nurses knew. Um, but but this is a very difficult area, and and there is no opportunity to discuss these cases as a rule because you worry about, will I lose my license? Will I be looked down on? Will I be considered a, quote, angel of death? God help us all. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is, this is why nurses don't talk about these experiences because they don't want other people's judgment. They may be not sure whether they did the right thing or not. And, I mean, I have some nurses who turned down a patient's request for assistance have said, said as part of their interview, it's the first question I'm going to ask God. You know, did I do the right thing in denying this young patient my assistance? Was that right or not? Because you don't know. It's not yeah. easy, right? I'm much more comfortable with what I do, uh, partly because, I guess, because I've been doing it for such a long time, and because people, patients, families find me, mm -hmm. um, and they are so much better, they feel so much better when they have accurate and complete information and they know when they're, they learn from me how to ask not just the first question to their physician, but the second question. And then the third question, um, they feel really empowered by information because they will then be able to decide what's right for them. So you're comfortable with the gray. Absolutely. I live in the land of gray. One thing that I heard you say, and I'm fresh air, was that there are many people whom death is not the worst thing that could happen. In fact, Absolutely. In fact, yeah. prolonging yeah. dying is the worst thing that could happen. Yeah. I'm wondering yeah. if you have an experience, I imagine you have more than one, that um, where prolonging life felt like the worst thing. Well, you know, I mean, as as you may remember, I've been particularly... Um, involved with folks with Alzheimer's these days. Um, couples where one member of the, of the marriage, the husband or the wife, have been diagnosed with an early stage of Alzheimer's disease. And in, in many of these cases, both husband and wife have very vivid memories of the deaths and the horrible prolonged deaths of loved ones who've died of Alzheimer's disease, often in a nursing home, long past the time that they were, you know, all of their, everything that made them unique, that made them their beloved grandparent or great-grandfather 
has been stripped away. They're a body in the bed, bent and twisted. And the only reason they're still there is because they still, for whatever reason, a reflex, I would say, open their mouth when a spoon is put at the side of the mouth. And so the glop gets dropped in and they gum it and they swallow it until the final stages of the final seventh stage of Alzheimer's disease is an inability to know what to do with the glop that's dropped in your mouth. And you aspirate it, you get pneumonia, and with any kind of luck, you die. So believe me, people who have seen those kinds of deaths really truly believe that that kind of a death is worse than living. Mm-hmm. To be trapped in a body that, that keeps you from dying because you have no control over it. I've worked with patients with Huntington's disease. Let me tell you what that's like. They can't walk across a room without falling down. They have no control over their body, but their mind is still there for a while. And they know exactly where their mind is going. It's horrible. It's absolutely a fate worse than death. And I'm not even talking about stuff like, you know, pain and and disfiguring wounds and, and, and what cancer can do to a body. But the thing is, you know, all of those states where aid and dying is, is legalized, um, physicians have to uh, provide information to the state about why their dying patients requested aid and dying. It's not about pain. Pain actually can be managed. But there are so many other horrible associations with an end stage of disease that can't be managed, you know, gaping wounds and, and horrible smells. You can't make that go away. And and the experience of that for both the person whose body it is, but also their loved ones, to have your grandchildren be aware of, of, of that kind of suffering that they see is a horrible thing that most most people would never want their their grandchildren to see or their children for that matter. When patients say to me, this is not how I want to spend the money I've worked my whole life to save. I want to be able to provide for my grandkids' education or I want to be able to help my daughter buy a house. I don't want to have to spend money on round-the-clock aids. I think that's just as important as other reasons that they find the life ahead of them, not a life that they want to live. We don't talk about that, though. Well, that that to me speaks to what you've been saying about empowering the people that you work with. What do you do with these strong feelings when they come up about the way the way somebody's end of life care is being managed? Well, again, you know, um, I have to continually remind myself that not everybody spends quite as much time as I do thinking about this stuff. And um, there's a lot of misinformation, ignorance, and fear. So depending upon who I'm speaking to or trying to help reframe the issue, um, if it's a doc, I send them, you know, professional journals that I've written or that other people have written. You know, it's always docs are much more likely to listen to another doc. It was one reason I got a PhD. But also um, in professional journals, you know, many of these issues have been long settled legally and clinically and ethically. But Physicians who haven't been to school in 25 or 30 years or haven't been doing much continuing education or haven't studied ethics, you know, I mean, this is not a field that everybody's familiar with, may genuinely not know that these kinds of choices are the patients and not theirs to make. So you have to you have to start with that, try to give them the information that might help them sort of step back a little bit and have a wider view. I can suggest to patients that they fire their physician and get another one, but that is very, very hard for most patients to do. They don't want to even consider that. I can't tell you how many, they're often little old ladies who will say to me, I don't want to disappoint my oncologist. He's been so kind to me and he wants me to have another trial, but I'm so tired of that. And I really would really like to get some symptom management, uh, but I'm, I'm afraid to tell him that. So <clears throat> I choose my <laughs> words carefully and gently encourage them 
to find some ways to have that conversation. But those are hard conversations, and I don't, I don't dismiss how how hard they are, and how um, many physicians have wonderful, caring, and long term relationships with their physician with their patients. Um, I I try to get other family members involved. It's easier to advocate for yourself if you have somebody else in the room or somebody who can do that for you. Mm -hmm. Um, It's really hard when you're feeling very ill to be a zealous advocate for yourself. I always want somebody else in the room when I'm speaking to patients. I want them to hear what I'm saying. It's very hard to remember all of this. And it gets, particularly when it's scary stuff, you remember every fourth word maybe. So, um, so I have to recognize that not everybody sees the world as I do. And my job is to try to educate and inform, but I can't make anybody, um, decide as I think they should. It's up to them. They have to decide. What kinds of conversations have you had with your family members about end of life? Well, I have two kids and of course I love them both, but, um, my daughter is a healthcare professional. She's a midwife. And she and I have talked about what my wishes are, and she's certainly grown up uh, around me talking about ethics and end-of-life decision-making all of her life, as has my son. I said, but my son would be looking for clinical trials and arguing with physicians about what else could be done because he was sure that there would be some cure that he could find. So I said, so of course I've appointed my daughter as my healthcare agent. Now, I'll tell you that my daughter jokingly refers to her job being to pull the plug. The fact is, there's often not a bloody plug to fill, to pull, and this will be very, very hard for her, as much as she thinks that uh, she's prepared. She's not. Um, When she has my very clearly written instructions, she will feel much better about doing what needs to be done when that time comes, because I will have written down exactly what I want and expect her to do. And she, and I'll and of course I'll show it both to her, to my son, to if my grandkids are old enough, God help us, um, them too. Everybody should know what's involved, and Jason's job will be to support Jesse. Period. And everyone will know where these instructions are. Lo- exactly. Located. Oh hell yes! <laughs> oh hell yes! They'll all, you know, I keep wanting to send them copies, but they keep saying, "Listen, I'm actually busy," and it's true. I mean, they. I swear to God, I'm surprised they haven't lost a kid so far. You know, my daughter, <laughs> she's got four of them, you know. So um, anyhow, so uh, and, you know, the fact is, I guess, mercifully, I'm quite healthy. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so but there will absolutely come a time uh, that that I will insist that she has one. You know, I might get it. What do you call that plastic stuff that you put on the thing? And so that she can, you know, I can tape it to her oh, refrigerator. Like laminated or something. Yes, laminated. That's, <laughs> that's what I need. But it's actually, it's several pages long. It's not just one. Um, but anyhow, uh, but no, it's, it's, an, it's a good question. And it's because it's not just a one top shot thing, right? It's a process that as one ages and as one has new experiences to incorporate, then there become issues that you hadn't maybe thought about before. So that has to be included as well. Well, and I love that you touch on both the kind of intellectual process of making these decisions and the emotional complexity and caring. Much harder, much harder, much harder. Um, And I, and I, again, I recognize that, but that, but that's the job of the healthcare agent is not to decide as they want for their mom, but out of respect and love, honoring what mom has already decided for herself. And that's much harder because, you know, there's a lot of joking and sarcasm in my family. And, um, and you know, it's a serious issue. It's a serious issue. So, I, I would never have guessed there's a lot of joking and sarcasm in your family. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's hard to <laughs> Usually very serious. (laughs) Dr. Judith Schwartz, thank you so much for joining me today. The word death evokes all sorts of personal feelings, images, and stories. These stories are amazing, and sharing them connects us more fully to life. I'm Ariane Elfant, and you have been listening to Death the Podcast. Join us for our next episode in this series. This show is produced and engineered by Eric Merle. 
Our associate producer is Jill Gross. Our theme music, It Happened, is written by David Milling and is performed by David Milling and Charles Milling. To hear more of David's music, go to his website, davidmilling.com. Our social media director is Jolie Robichaud. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher or some other podcast app, if you can take a moment to rate and review us, that helps other people find us. You can find Death the Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, or at deaththepodcast.com. Death the Podcast is a production of INO Broadcasting. Labor Day signals the unofficial end of summer, but not the end of your outdoor projects. Lowe's helps you do it right and helps you save with Labor Day deals throughout the store. Shop now and get two bags of Stay Green Potty Mix for $12. And keep your lawn looking neat and trim with a Craftsman 2-Cycle 17-inch gas string trimmer, now $20 off at just $119. Whatever's still on your to-do list this Labor Day, do it right for less. Start with Lowe's. Offers valid through 828. Soil offer excludes Alaska and Hawaii, U.S. only.